Another important task that's been undertaken by philosophers of science is to try to understand just what sort of thing an explanation is. Uh, especially interesting, of course, to philosophers of science are scientific explanations because they seem to be so successful. But what is an explanation? Is there one model for explanations or are there a variety of ways in which things might be explained? Remember, we're looking for styles of explanation, not particular explanations. We're going to look at that today and we're going to look at the special role that it might be thought that causation or causality plays in scientific explanations. What science is supposed to do is to provide us with explanations. That at least is, seems to be, to a lot of people, there are, as you might expect, there's disagreement among philosophers about this. But uh, to a lot of people, what we have science for in the first place was to provide explanations for things that puzzled us. That's what we want it to do, is to provide us with explanations. I want to talk about explanation and a couple of models for the structure of explanation that have been proposed. Uh, I want to talk about these various models and then I want to raise some problems. That's about as far as we're going to get. Now what I'm going to do is just lunge way back historically and talk to you a little bit about Aristotle because curiously enough he set things up in a, in a kind of a neat way that um, continues to be influential. Uh, Aristotle talked about explanation in terms of what, ha what he called and what people have called since his day uh, Aristotle's four causes. Now has anyone encountered these things before? Aristotle's four causes? Uh, do you remember anything about them? Yeah, that's good. Material cause. I'm going to put these in quotes. Two. I'll make it formal cause. Just hardly matters which one comes first or, wh or how, what the order is. But three. Efficient cause. Four. Uh, final. Now what you'll see as we go on is that uh, this use of the term cause is a fairly unusual one given our normal English way of, of uh, using the word. Um, what you ought to see, what, what you'll see here is that Aristotle offered uh, four sorts of things that you might want to address if you were going to try to explain something. You're going to try to understand it. You would want to know, I'll put it in Aristotle's way, you will want to know its material cause, you'll want to know its formal cause, you'll want to know its efficient cause, and you'll want to know its vital cause. Now what I'm going to try and do for the first few minutes here is just explain what that's all about. Um, and then we're going to jump back into the present and talk about some other models of explanation that emphasize, or that come back to some of these things here. Um, the material cause of something is what it's made of, or what its structure is. It has to do with a uh, question like stuff. What, uh, I said, forget about structure. It's what it's made of. What's the basic stuff? Uh, you may know that uh, the pre-Socratic philosophers uh, who uh, preceded not only Aristotle, but preceded Plato, uh, and they have their group name, the pre-Socratics, because they, they preceded Socrates. But um, uh, the, they, many of them anyway, were obsessed with questions like, what is the real, uh, essential, fundamental, basic stuff of the universe? Uh, there was, first of all, the kind of standard theory that there's four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. And then among the pre-Socratics, you'd find that you know, Thales, for example, thought that water was more basic than the other three, and different ones of them uh, took on different alternatives. Uh, Heraclitus, on one interpretation, can be held to have thought that fire was more basic than the other three, and would then argue with Thales. Heraclitus' position actually was that what's really apparent in the world is that change is basic, and fire 
uh, he chose as emblematic of that fact. But um, the question, what sorts, what is the stuff that the world is made up of, that is the kind of question that you would be asking if you wanted to know its material cause. Uh, again, the four elements, uh, I think it's as late as the 1700s or 1600s, I'm not sure, but the four elements then became something like 33 in one fell swoop, and then over the next couple of hundred years it moved from 33 up to 90, 92, 91, I guess. Well, 91 would stop there for a while, and then with further uh, investigations it began to move on up past 100. Um, so, but those, but, but again, that inquiry, the attempt to try and figure out what are the basic things out of which everything else is made, what's the basic, what are the basic stuffs, or what is the basic stuff, that has, uh, that has been a, a standard uh, sort of scientific question and philosophical question for as long as we've been around. Um, and again, as you may know, the question about uh, what is the basic stuff as it leads through this larger and larger number of chemical elements led to a, a, a deeper theory, an atomic theory that suggested in each and every one of those Elements could be understood as just different configurations of, uh, well, of, of, at first, just different configurations of electrons around a positively charged nucleus. And then as time went by, they found more and more particles. The, 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 uh, the proton was uh, identified as, a, uh, uh, as having a companion. It wasn't just a positively charged particle in the nucleus, but there were char positively charged and neutral particles. This was very late. I think it was in the 30s before the neutron was discovered. Um, and then, beyond, then after that, another explosion in the number of, uh, of small particles that were discovered. And more recently yet, there is a quark theory that says that each and every one of these subatomic particles, the electrons, the positrons, the pi mesons, the mu mesons, the neutrons, the protons, all these, this larger and larger number of subatomic particles, all of them can be understood as different combinations of a, a small set of quarks and leptons. Uh, so there's, you know, always, there seems to be a constant effort to try and understand what are the basic things or what's the basic stuff out of which the world is made. And this question about stuff now, insofar as it is a question of stuff, you know, what kind of thing, what is the, mat what is the material out of which the world is made, uh, that's the kind of cause that I've uh, numbered here is number one. That's the material cause. And so one of the things you want to do, if you want to explain something or understand it, is figure out what it's made of. And that's the sort of question we have there. Um, the formal cause is something that Plato emphasized. Uh, we want to know, if we want to know, if, if, we, if, we, uh, if, if we're curious about something, we want to know what kind of thing it is what type, what category, what form it has. We want to know uh, how to identify it as being a member of a larger class. All these, I think, are different ways of saying the same thing. But uh, that's a second sort of thing that uh, Aristotle identified as being um, you know, it's a different kind of question, but it's, it's, it's something that you want to know if you really want to understand a phenomenon or a thing. Um, again, uh, there can be debates about what, ca what category particular well-known phenomena should belong to. There are debates about how to define compound versus mixture in the history of chemistry. There's a debates in zoology about just where should whales end up in our classification schema. Should they be fish? Should they be mammals? Uh, these questions have a certain importance. They have an organizational importance anyway uh, in science. But part of their importance, and we're going to come back to laws later on, is that once you know what category or class of thing a particular phenomenon or particular item in the world belongs to, then you'll know, you'll have a better idea anyway, what laws it obeys to the extent that you have laws that cover those classes of things or those items. So once you've identified a thing as belonging to a certain class or being in a certain type, 
that can give you considerable information about it. It can give you information about what to expect of it. So that's what we're talking about when we speak about formal cause, trying to find out what kind of thing, what type, or what category it belongs to. Thirdly, efficient cause. What's that? You remember? The artist creating a sculpture, or, or in the case of sci uh, physics, natural sciences, you know, what is it that brought something about, brought it into existence? This is, I think you'll agree with me. If you if you have a different sense of this, let me know. But as far as I can tell, this is the sense that we would normally use the word cause in when we talk about something causing something else. We're talking about it's bringing it about, bringing it into being. Uh, it's an important thing to know if you wish to explain a phenomenon or a thing how it came. Up into being. Yeah? How can anything have a cause? I mean, like, what cause is not a revolution? Your point is, what, you know, is, is a good one if you mean to say that you can't give a complete explanation of, of the causes of anything without giving an entire history of the universe, which may go back ad infinitum, and including all the detail, perhaps, of the universe, including the butterflies flapping their wings on the other side of the planet. Uh, one, you know, you can stop that chain any time by saying, look, I don't wish I didn't ask for a complete <laughs> causal analysis. I wanted to have a rather localized causal analysis because there's some things I already understand and I don't need an explanation of them. And what I want to know is I want to clear up the mystery. And it may be a mystery. I may have to have my back turned and say, hey, huh, how come the eight ball fell in the pocket? And you tell me I hit it. I don't need to have an explanation <clears throat> in order to satisfy my need. I don't need to have an explanation of how you brought that about. I have a pretty good idea how you brought it about. You went like that. <laughs> so so uh, again, our explanations, we cut them off in large part because we don't need to go further than some point. We need to have things explained. This is, we're jumping the gun a little bit, but we need to have things explained against a background of other things that we take to be fairly well explained, fairly well in hand. Good, good question. Uh, Causal explanation, though, on no one's account, needs to be a complete ca causal explanation of all the causes and their causes and their causes and their causes. All it has to do is to explain uh, to some degree uh, what it is that brought an event or an existent thing into being. So again, efficient causes, that's the one that we would familiarly call a cause. Is that clear? Any other questions about that? Okay, now the final cause um, can be described in a lot of ways. One way that makes it seem a little more mysterious than it needs to is to uh, uh, talk about it as the goal uh, for which a thing is in existence. Now with artifacts, you can talk about that pretty easily. You can talk about uh, uh, chairs, and perhaps to explain a chair is, is it's best to explain what it's designed to do. It's designed uh, in order to accommodate sitting. And for artifacts, things that are made with a purpose, uh, it's pretty easy to th see what we would be talking about when we were speaking about a final cause where, we're, where we say that the final cause means to explain things in terms of their, the purpose that they serve. And for a long period of history, um, and to this day uh, for many people, um, the entire world, the people in it, the organisms in it are understood to be artifacts. You understand what I'm referring to. Uh, for many people, the entire universe is something designed by God. And in such a way of thinking about things, then we have to puzzle over what the purpose of humanity is, and what the purpose of the bat is, and what the purpose of any particular animal might be, or at least what the purpose of biology is. And uh, while that is a meaningful question to a lot of people, for other people, that's a meaningful question, really, only for artifacts. And uh, lots of folks say, you know, the objects of nature, the things not designed by human beings, aren't artifacts. They are natural. They are, they're a different class of things. They have no purposes in particular. 
That doesn't, though, mean that the, whole, the area of final cause isn't relevant to people who deny God or deny that people in the natural world <coughs> are artifacts. Because that category captures such things as this. If you want to explain the human heart, for example, if you want to understand the human heart, one way of saying that is you, uh, of, of one, sorry, I mean, you might understand perfectly well what it's made of, and you might understand perfectly well what kind of thing it is. It's a human heart. And you might understand perfectly well how it came to be through a particular developmental process initiated by uh, uh, a, a conception of, a, of, a, of an embryo. And then you could trace the efficient causes you know, of why this particular human heart came to be uh, and came to, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, someone, I think, quite reasonably, biologists, for example, would say, well, you really haven't gotten down to the question, have you? You ha really haven't gotten down to it to explain the human heart. We want to understand this thing. You've given us a lot of information. We still don't understand it. What's missing? Well, you might be tempted to say what's missing is an understanding of its purpose. Another way of putting that that doesn't imagine it to be an artifact is what you're missing is an understanding of its function in a larger system. So for many sorts of things, the key to understanding it will be lost if all you had were one, two, and three. You need to understand if you want to know, if you, if you want to know why it's there, what's, what's it doing in the human organism, uh, it's partially because it plays a certain vital role. And, it's, and this becomes especially important in evolutionary accounts as well as creation accounts of, uh, of people. So you get, you get in the history of, uh, of uh, the philosophy of biology, you get biologists talking, trying to avoid the word teleological, because teleological is a word that has always meant what? Does anyone know? Purpose. purpose. It's always referred to purpose. And uh, teleological, and so this, this uh, uh, Aristotle's fourth cause, his uh, discussion of uh, explaining things in terms of their final cause, their end, their goal or purpose, uh, that's always, another way of putting that has been uh, to give a teleological explanation of things. But especially in the 20th century, uh, people have sought some other expression for that kind of thing. They don't want to leave the impression that they believe that the human heart has been designed and has a purpose. And so they've groped for other expressions like teleonomic. Some philosophers of biology, some biologists have coined the term teleonomic to sort of capture the idea of an explanation of the function of something. But let's forget about those fancy words. Uh, for now, um, what I want to I want to talk about these uh, in terms of functions, and so what uh, what I think is best captured in number four is the idea that in order to understand something, it's useful and in some cases central to understand what its role is in some larger whole. Okay, so those are the four causes. The material cause talks about uh, what kind of stuff a thing is made of. If you want to understand something, that would be an important thing to know about. If you really want to fully understand something, you also want to know what kind of thing it is, what category or class of thing it belongs to. What is the form that it is an instantiation of, to use uh, sort of Plato's type language, for those of you who have studied Plato's theory of forms. Uh, the efficient cause explains what brings something about, and the final cause explains its function in, uh, in a larger system, or its function vis-a-vis -vis other things. So these are, this is Aristotle's attempt to account for uh, what we seek in an explanation. And his answer was different things, different sorts of things. Here are the four. We can say here are at least four. Maybe there are other things that he forgot or he omitted. Uh, what's curious about these people that listed things millions of years ago and that the lists have survived, it's real difficult to find things that don't fall into their four categories or their three, their lists of five thises and six thats. And it would be, I think it's difficult to think of something that doesn't uh, fall somewhere in this range, the range of the four causes. Yeah? So these uh, four statements are still considered relevant today then? 
Sure. This isn't just for historical reasons. Absolutely. This is not for historical reasons. And what we'll see is a couple of things. First of all, uh, especially up until, um, especially in Newtonian physics, so up until uh, this century, the early part of this century, um, what, have, what have been emphasized are two sorts of things. First of all, in Newtonian physics, very much the efficient causes have been emphasized. You know, trying to figure out the causal relationships between things. What are the causal laws that govern uh, the world? Uh, that is captured in the uh, intuition of some Newtonians, notably Pierre Laplace, that, uh, that the entire universe is really just a deterministic sort of clockwork, a big mechanism. And if we knew the simultaneous positions and momentums, momenta of all the particles in the universe, uh, then given the laws of physics, we would be able to predict everything else that ever ha would happen, because it's all determined in advance through these causal laws. Okay. Um, and you know, what, you know, if we know the positions of momentum, we know what, what, what will happen when, the, when the things collide and, and all that stuff. That's been sort of upset in the 20th century, that particular kind of Laplacian or Newtonian determinism. But uh, that has guided physics certainly more than final causes have. Uh, and the other one is material cause. We spent an awful lot of time in the history of, uh, of, of uh, Western science in trying to figure out what things are made of. That's been another central obsession. Uh, again, uh, formal causes come, come, become important in taxonomy, they're, they're, but they're sort of a, of a lesser, a lower level of importance, usually. We, we do want to know what categories things belong to so that we can then know how to talk about them, so we then know which laws apply to them. But uh, that has never th been taken to be as deep an undertaking as understanding the basic stuff, the basic stuffs, or the basic structure of the universe, and uh, the basic laws guiding causation. So right up to the present, uh, up to the 20th century, material cause and efficient cause are the sorts of, uh, those are the explanations that have been stressed in physics. Um, up until evolutionary theory, taxonomy, you know, classifying things had been of, of central importance in, in biology, in all the areas of biology, trying to figure out just what the hierarchies are, which, how to you know, sort species into, into genus, geni, genera, whatever, <laughs> genuses, um, and trying to figure out which, which species of animals belong with which others, and uh, how then to make that classification. Uh, that's also true in the plant world, uh, you know, in, you know, in uh, trying to uh, give a taxonomy of plants. Uh, and then final causes have been important in biology as well. What's intriguing is that in the 20th century, uh, efficient cause may be, at least in some areas of physics, no longer quite so important. And the uh, material cause continues on in trying to figure out what's, what things are made of that continues to be of some central interest to physicists. But that's, that gives you kind of an overview, which is interesting, again, not because it's history. I'm glad you brought that up. I want to emphasize that. It's not just because it's history. It's because early on, Aristotle captured something that seems to be kind of basic and seems to you know, be still pretty much correct. And some, some of the excesses of more recent uh, philosophers of science and scientists who have talked about scientific explanation have been corrected by people who said, now wait a minute, you're forgetting about this over here that Aristotle emphasizes, and that, that if, you, if you had emphasized that too, you wouldn't have, be having these problems you're having with your new model of explanation. Um, Baruch Brody, in particular, once wrote an article that kind of um, was at least of, of considerable interest because he said, is, is there anything, can we, can we settle for anything less than good old-fashioned Aristotelian essentialism? Uh, that is in which he, and this is an article that was written for mainstream philosophy of science and uh, in part um, defended some other things that Aristotle had said in connection with this stuff, uh, uh, defended that against uh, some, some more recent models of scientific explanation. So, uh, you know, as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, uh, Aristotle's theory of explanation was still very much discussed. Could you briefly uh, say what your point was on artifacts again? Yeah, that had to do with uh, talking about the final cause. 
and I uh, was. Uh, Yeah, I was saying that uh, if, if we understand final cause to refer to the purpose a thing has, I later offered you a different interpretation in terms of, terms of function that doesn't have this problem. If we understand, as people did for hundreds and hundreds of years, if, uh, if we understand final cause or teleological explanations to be giving an account of the purposes of things, then it's easy to understand what that means when we're talking about artifacts, things that people design deliberately, because undoubtedly they do have purposes. So when we talk about podiums, and I want to know if I want to understand this thing, well clearly one of the things I do need to understand is what it's for, what's its purpose. Same with a television. Uh, same with these cameras and books and all that stuff. If I want to understand them, you can give me an awful lot of information by telling me what this is made of, telling me what kind of thing it is. It's a book. Uh, uh, telling me that it was produced in a certain plant in, God, Massachusetts, uh, MIT Press book. I don't know, actually the plant might not be there, but it was, you know, I, I can give you an efficient cause of how these pages came to be sewn into this binding. You won't understand a damn thing about this unless you understand, ah, this is for a certain purpose. This is designed to, to, uh, to bring uh, information to people. I don't know what the hell it's made for, but I mean, <laughs> what are books for? <laughs> to read, okay. And, uh, and you won't understand this podium. You really, you know, you really want to, you want to touch the issue until you understand what it's made, uh, what it's made for, what its purpose is. Um, and for artifacts, that makes perfect sense because they are made for something. They, won't, they don't come to be except in terms of people's intentions. Now those may require further explanation, but uh, let's just stop it right there. For artifacts, the idea that final cause or teleological explanation is relevant, important, valuable. That's not controversial. I think we'd all agree with it. Where we might disagree is about trees. And you say, all right, what's the purpose of a tree? Good question. Uh, right. Now, what I was saying there was, actually, that wasn't such a bad question and isn't such a bad question for people who understand the entire universe to be the artifact of God and the product of God's design. I mean, for within that conceptual scheme, within that frame of reference, it makes perfect sense to try and figure out what the purpose of a human being is, or humanity is, or trees are, or biology. I mean, you can do this at any level of abstraction you please. What's the purpose of the whole universe? It makes perfect sense to ask that question for people who look at things from that framework. They imagine the universe to have been created by design just as any other artifact. What I wanted to uh, argue was that that may seem to place a limitation on the value and the importance of final cause or teleological explanation for those people who do not think of the natural world as an artifact. I wanted to say there is another interpretation that brings back the importance of final cause within the natural world even for such people, even for people who do not think of human beings and trees as artifacts or humanity as an artifact or the biological world or the, or the physical world as an artifact. And that is this. Think of final cause teleological explanation <laughs> as attempting to understand the functions that things play in larger systems, the roles that, for example, the, human, the role that the human heart plays within the human biological system. Uh, and it doesn't have to be human beings. You can try and understand the function of chlorophyll in a plant, in the leaf of a plant. What does it do? What is its function? What is its role vis-a-vis -vis other things? How does it uh, fit into the overall development of the plant? What role does it play? Now that's still a dodgy question. It's real easy. It's real easy to this day 
when you're wanting to know what the function of chlorophyll is, to say, what's its purpose? <laughs> Whether or not you really believe that someone designed this thing, or a mind designed it, it's still real easy to talk that way. It's real easy to say that when you want to know what's the function of the human heart, uh, you say, well, what's its purpose? Ah, to pump blood. That's what it's there for. That's the most natural way in the world to talk, even though when pressed, I certainly don't think that someone said, gee, how are we going to design this human being now? How are we going to get the blood around? God, I know. Let's put a heart in there. I, mean, I don't believe anything that ever happened. So the point of talking about uh, artifacts was to say uh, there, that it, it, it's pretty pretty easy to understand how to interpret this whole idea of final cause or teleological explanation when it comes to artifacts. It's a little dodgier when we're trying to talk about things that aren't artifacts, things that aren't made, things that we regard as natural. And in that connection, I offered you a different interpretation of final cause in terms of function rather than purpose. Is that clear or is that just a lot more words? Daryl? Not sure yet. Okay. Having given you that basic sketch, I now want to go into you know, what might seem a little bit different. It, it's not entirely different, but a specific model of not just explanation in general and not just what are we looking for, because that's the sort of thing that Aristotle was trying to explain. But we want to know the mechanism. How do scientific explanations work? And I'm going to take uh, my um, suggestion uh, from well, originally, Carl Hempel and Paul Oppenheim jointly published an article in which they offered a particular model of scientific explanation. Uh, later on, uh, Hempel added to it. Uh, he offers the following fairly straightforward uh, picture of what a scientific explanation must do. Actually, there's two pictures, so bear with me. First picture, both of these are uh, part of what's called Hempel's covering law model of scientific explanation, covering law model. And what they both come down to is uh, this. They say that to explain something is to subsume it or show that it's an instance of a, of, a, of a known law. If you can do that, you've explained it. Or not just a known law, but the known laws. This is the. Uh, deductive, meaning it's a deductive uh, structure for scientific explanation, nomological type of explanation. This is one of two. The word nomological refers to uh, laws, nomos, law. Uh, it's a deduction from laws. And the idea is this. So we talked about deductive inference before, I think, and distinguished it from induction at some point in the course. Did we not? OK. Um, we start with a series of laws. Well, no, here, let's, we start with something we want to explain, E. <coughs> That's usually called the, the explanandum. So when you see that dumb word, that Latin word come up in an article, it's talking about the thing that we're trying to explain. It's just a short way of saying that. OK, dot, 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 L, N, C, 1, C, 2, dot, dot, C, N. These things are called the explanons. This is what is doing the explaining, and this is the thing that needs to be explained. What you do is, if you want to explain something on this model, the deductive nomological model, it's also called the DN <laughs> model uh, for short, the DN model of explanation, what you do is you show that given certain known laws plus certain initial conditions, that's what the C stand, C's stand for, one could deduce, one could deduce uh, that the thing we're trying to explain must occur, given those conditions, given those laws. So for example, let's just take a, a rather simple 
example. Let's say there's, the sun is up, there's a, 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 a flagpole uh, standing in, in the yard, and it's, the flagpole has a shadow. Let's say we want to know how to explain the length of that shadow. How come the shadow is just that long? Well, given the laws of optics, Newtonian optics are good enough here, given the laws of optics and the position of the sun, we have to have information about the position of the sun, the laws of optics, and the height of the flagpole, we can use, now the, 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 the laws of optics are, the, are, are going to be found among the L's, and the initial conditions are going to be such things as the height of the flagpole and the present position of the sun. We will then be able to deduce from that information that the shadow must be just so long on a flat. I mean, other initial conditions are that the, that the, the ground on which the shadow is projected be flat or perpendicular, normal to the uh, flagpole itself etc etc but you can see the sorts of things you have to pack into the initial conditions to make the explanation work and there may be some other laws or law like auxiliary uh, statements uh, background assumptions that we pack to pack into the L's but to explain something is to show that it, it comes out as a deductive uh, uh, a consequence of some set of laws plus some set of initial conditions that's the deductive nomological model of explanation. It says that's what we strive for to the extent that we can get it in science. We try to show that things must happen. We try and show that they are necessary consequences of the, the conditions that preceded it uh, along with the laws that we know. That's what we'd love to do whenever we can. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, it sounds a little strong to me. Um, yeah. I mean, this will occur, occur if you have, you know, this law and this thing. You can't do something like that for a radioactive breakdown. Yeah, and that's why we have to go to the second thing. That's why I stress the back. You're, you're absolutely right to show that. So let me uh, sketch it. And I, This is the desideratum. This is what we would like to get if we could. If we could show that something has to follow as a consequence, that it can be deductively demonstrated, uh, from the laws of nature that we know and the initial conditions, that would be a, a maximally ideal explanation, says Hempel. Uh, Hempel said there's another kind of explanation that's especially relevant when it comes to you know, radioactive materials and things like that. That's called probabilistic explanation. Okay. And I'm going to not use radiation, I think uh, leave that as an exercise for the student because that's not really what I'm interested in getting at right now. What I'll use instead is something uh, much more down to earth and mundane. Let's if one is exposed to measles, I mean let's say what I want to explain again is why did Mo get <laughs> measles? If one is exposed to measles, uh, uh, probability of contracting it is high. Mo was exposed to measles. Therefore, and this is now no longer a deductive uh, link. This is, <laughs> these double bars, Hempel said, means makes <coughs> highly probable. So I want to emphasize that uh, uh, both deductive nomological explanations and probabilistic explanations are different kinds of covering law explanations. So they all fit within Hempel's covering law model of scientific explanation. But it's just because, more than any other thing, that we cannot deduce the precise timing of the, de of the, de of, uh, the decay of one more <laughs> atom of, uh, uh, of radium uh, or, of, or of its change of state. We cannot, the laws of physics do not allow us to do this. I mean, it's actually more severe than that. But at least we, the laws of physics will not allow to, us to do this. It's for that reason that um, 
that Hempel was, and, and others have been forced to try and understand probabilistic explanation as well as deterministic or deductive nomological explanation. It's not because of examples uh, like the one I'm using from, uh, from uh, medicine um, <coughs> that we need probabilistic explanations, although we certainly do need them there. We need them in most of, the, most of our sciences. It's that even in physics now, the goal, it does not seem reasonable to have as your goal deductive nomological explanations in all cases. There's lots of areas where we still can, but these are, these are the kinds of explanations that still seem to suit just fine at the Newtonian level of objects. If the Newtonian level of objects is sort of the middle range, they're not as big as galaxies, uh, and they're not as tiny as atoms. The middle range of objects seems to work real fine. Uh, as far as Newtonian physics is concerned. In that range of objects, uh, deduc deductive nomological explanations seem to work just fine uh, for physics. But uh, in other areas, especially at the quantum level, the subatomic level, we need probabilistic explanations. Now look at this. If one is exposed to measles, the probability of contracting it is high. That's the law-like, the probabilistic generalization or probabilistic law that we could probably spruce up a bit. I'll spruce it up in one way right now. We might be able to make it more precise. Mo was exposed to measles. Therefore, the probability that he got, that he would get the measles, was increased. Sometimes that'll do. If we want to know, how come we caught the measles? It's probably enough to say, well, it was really going around. <laughs> it's going around, and you, what, you're, you teach at college, don't you? <laughs> and you guys are students at college, aren't you? Well, you know, places like that, uh, these diseases that start uh, moving around real fast, it's real hard to avoid them. That's where contagions work their evil ways. Uh, so that sometimes is sufficient. But, oh well, but before I go to the but, notice that you know, the ways of sprucing this up are actually specifying what the probability is. So you might say it's P, <laughs> 0.85. I don't know. You might be able to specify this in some statistical way. And that might seem more, satis more satisfying. And then down here, uh, the way this works is if you're able to specify uh, what, you know, what the degree of probability is of this law, then that usually works out to being able to specify what precisely the probability is that Mo got measles. You're, st you're making some statistical assumptions here that not everybody would make. Because uh, this, this number here, uh, if, one is expo if you have a law that really said, look, uh, if you're exposed to measles, then uh, the probability is 0.85 that you're going to get them. That kind of law usually comes from uh, statistics, right? You know, that, you know, given the number, numbers of people, as near as we can calculate them, that, that uh, in, in large populations, people who are exposed to the disease seem to get it about 0.85 of the time. I mean, so often this represents frequencies. So that the data here about statistical law, statistical or probabilistic laws often have to do with frequencies of events in large populations. And yet what you're trying to explain is an individual instance. And so there you've got a different interpretation of probability. Uh, now I don't want to go into that. That's, uh, there's a whole area of philosophy and mathematics that deals with probability theory. So that there's something dodgy about going from the frequency interpretation of, of probability that usually you have in mind up here in your law to the individual case kind of probability that you usually have in mind in the conclusion. Nonetheless, there's something like, it seems like there, there is some kind of relationship between the probability of this, you know, that, that's attached to this generalization and the probability that exposure of an individual will lead to measles. I just want you to be aware of the fact that there is a little bit of ambiguity there about probability. Um, and sometimes in physics we can get some awfully good, we can get some, um, some uh, estimates of, of um, uh, probabilities of uh, decay that are really quite fine within a range. So we can say that within uh, a certain amount of time the probability is 0.99999 that half uh, the radium will have decayed. And so then we can, if, if our, if our uh, initial condition is the radium was left around <laughs> for uh, the half-life, <laughs> the, the half-life period, 
that we could draw a pretty good, with 0.99999 probability, that half of the radium had decayed in that particular sample. Those are probabilistic explanations. I'll talk about a problem with probabilistic explanation, then I want to go back to a problem with deductive nomologic, and I'll leave you there. I'm not going to solve these problems. Uh, I wanted first to make them both plausible as, as models of what it is we seek <coughs> when we try to explain something. Uh, what we would try as, I mean, Hempel's final position was that uh, we try uh, uh, as hard as we can to achieve a deductive nomological type explanation to show that something has to happen given the laws we know. We also try and find laws that will serve deductive nomological explanations. We would prefer deterministic laws where we, where we could get them to probabilistic ones. So this is the, the goal, the, the, the desire of, uh, of science is to, uh, is to, is to, set, is to uh, work out uh, deductive nomological explanations for phenomena. Where we can't get it, though, we uh, do have, Hempel says, recourse to a, a slightly less uh, satisfying kind of covering law explanation, namely a probabilistic explanation. Now, here's the problem. This is a Van Frossen point. I'm not sure that it's original with him, but it's one that uh, he is, he's well known for. Uh, the, um, let's just, uh, I mean, we, what we've explained here, and it was actually brought up in the back, what we've explained here might be something like this. How come Mo got measles uh, as opposed to somebody who wasn't in the class exposed? I mean, we're, we now have an idea why uh, Mo got measles contrasted with the class of persons who weren't exposed. So relative to a particular contrast class, uh, we now know um, we have a, we have a fairly satisfying explanation of why Mo got the measles. But among the people who were exposed, this is your point, among the people who were exposed to measles, some of them did get it and some of them didn't. We don't have an explanation, given that contrast class, given that background, we don't have any explanation about why Mo, not here anyway, we don't have an explanation of why Mo got it and those other people didn't. They were all exposed. And with probabilistic laws, you have that problem. You, a probabilistic explanation will be satisfying against some contrast classes, but not against others. The shortcomings of probabilistic explanations is just that. Um, while such things, they're not explanations, period. I mean, what they only explain against a certain contrast class. And so if, you wanted, if what you wanted to know is why did Mo get measles, period, this will do. But if you wanted to know why did Mo get measles but not Joe, who lives in the same house with Mo, <laughs> was also exposed, how come Joe didn't get it? Uh, why did Mo get the measles, if that's what you wanted to know? And it's the same question, right? But, if that's, but, but again, you're asking this now with a different contrast class in mind, then this won't serve. Because I'll say, well, he was exposed to it. And you'll say, yeah, but so was Joe. <laughs> and he didn't get it. I want to go to the problems with deductive nomological explanations. There's something that really is uh, uh, avoided, it would seem, by uh, the whole idea of, probable, uh, of, of, of deductive nomological explanation. I'll put, and that's this. Let me go back to the example I used uh, before. I said, um, if we had the law of, laws of optics and we knew the position of the sun and we knew the height of the flagpole, we would be able to explain the, why the shadow is just the length that it is. We would do that by showing that the shadow would have to be that length, given other background assumptions like the flatness of the ground and all that stuff. It would have to be that length, given these laws and those initial conditions. And so we would thereby appear to have explained the length of the shadow reasonably well, if that was our problem. Well, here's a curiosity. You can also deduce the height of the flagpole <coughs> if what you know is the length of the shadow, the laws of optics, the position of the suns. I mean, what you could do is you could take one of these initial conditions and drop it down here, put the E up there, and it would seem on this model, it would seem that you should be able to explain why the flagpole is just the height that it is on the basis of the length of the shadow. Now, that seems strange. 
Now, why should the length of the shadow plus the laws of optics explain the height of the flagpole? But on this model, it would seem to. Summarize this uh, as, um, as an asymmetry problem, an asymmetry problem with, uh, with deductive nomological explanations. It, it's lacking something. It says, here's, how, here's what it is to explain something, to show that it can be derived from uh, initial conditions and uh, the laws that we know. But sometimes, some of the things that can be derived from initial conditions uh, and lo the laws that we know do not seem thereby to be explained. And in particular, and this is where I want to leave you for now, in particular, it would seem that the difference between those two anyway has to do with our intuitions or maybe things that we know. I don't want to make it more squishy than it needs to be about which way the causal linkages go. It's not just that you can logically deduce the length of the shadow from this other information about the flagpole. It's that there's a, it's because the sun is, it's because the sun is causing that, or the, the, the not the sun, but the light from the sun uh, being blocked by the flagpole is making that shadow happen. It's because there's a causal relationship that's one way that we can explain the length of the shadow in terms of the height of the flagpole plus the laws, but not the other way around. I mean, the, that's why one direction explains and the other doesn't. So again, here, I, I, again, it's not that either of these problems are not answerable. What I want to leave you with is this. I wanted you to explain to you a, a fairly standard model of scientific explanation that's been uh, widely discussed and widely <laughs> held by people, Hempel's covering law model. It's got two aspects to it. Uh, deductive nomological explanations, that's one kind of explanation, the preferred kind, and probabilistic explanations, that's the not so desirable kind, but we have to resort to them in the modern world. Um, and uh, I wanted to explain those fully to you, let you think about them. Also want to leave you with those problems, the asymmetry problem. There are others, but the asymmetry problem is an interesting one because it, uh, uh, with deductive nomological explanations, because it seems to suggest that there's some understanding of causal relationships that, that underlie, that, you know, go beyond, I mean, we have to add a condition. Uh, a thing is explained if it can be deduced from laws and conditions and can be shown to be a causal effect of those laws, or of those conditions given those laws. That will explain it, but Hempel didn't say that. He didn't add that clause. And it's hard to write that clause out. And as uh, uh, I mentioned, uh, David Hume and all subsequent empiricists, anyway, have had a real tough time figuring out just what causation really is. The issue we've been discussing this time about the nature of explanation, about the requirements of scientific explanation in particular, and about the possible special role that causality might play in scientific explanation, these questions come up most poignantly and most starkly uh, in modern physics, and especially in quantum mechanics.